Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm with the proclamation of the faith of our heart, the promise that relates to the coming of Jesus Christ, when He, at the door of our hope, will come to be glorified in the bodies of His saints. Let the resurrection of Christ raise, raise in our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the covenant of blood to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all burden and sin that binds us. May in the service be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, ignorance, selfishness, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people. And stand, Lord, on the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might. And may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your divine arms, and we ask you to continue to lead it with your high and uplifted hand, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The Book of Apostle Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God into righteousness and holiness. And so the right to set aside the former way of life in order to clothe our bodies into a new way of life. And for this commanding commandment, written by Apostle Paul and presented to us in the series of sermons of Apostle Arcadia, there are three fateful foundational verbs and actions. This is to set aside, to renew, and to clothe. These are fateful, commanding, and fundamental actions. Commandments that were presented to us in the labor of our pastor and apostle, Brother Arkati. And I would once again like to tell those saints who are listening and to hear on the sermons on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays to turn to the original where this sermon was said by our pastor because the church must remember the voice of their apostle. So the water, and we don't have just one of them, those who are remembering the truths that pray according to it, each of us are called to be a water when we are ourselves in our secret room proclaiming the faith of our heart. We also are watering those promises that are in our heart. We must remember that despite the fact that we do this, we must always remember the voice of our father or the voice of the mother. Like a small infant, just as we had just dedicated a small child, she distinguishes the voice from her mother from a thousand other voices. This doesn't mean that I, as a water, who dwell in this service, my voice distinguishes from the Father. No, it's the same voice, but there is a person who waters the truth, and there's a person who plants this truth. And we must remember that this will be good for us to continually turn and return to the archives and listen to the original, how these truths were presented by our pastor brother, Arkady. We, for example, are covering uh, December 2019, and I would like to ask all saints who preach on Tuesdays or any other day for them to specifically rem remind the dates. When they're preparing a sermon, you can say, you can find this sermon in the archive, for example, December 2019. Thus, when people then listen to the sermon, they'll say, well, what wonderful thoughts. I remember this was said, but I had forgotten it, and now I've remembered. And for me to not go back, um, we will hear the dates from the person that will read the labors of our pastor on Tuesday to remember these dates. And this will help saints to easier find this in our archive and to re-listen to it again. And so for the fulfillment of these three requirements will depend the perfection of our salvation that is given to us in the format of a seed so that we can gain it as a property in the format of the fruit of righteousness. 
And with regard to this, we have stopped to study the 18th Psalm of David, in which acknowledgment and proclamation of the powers contained in the heart of David and the eight names of God had allowed David to love and call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and it gave God the basis to use the powers of these capabilities in battles against the enemies of David. So Psalms 18 verses 1 through 4, I will love you, O Lord, my strength, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Let us all together affirm these names in our proclamations. And so, Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are my rock. Lord, you are my fortress. Lord, you are my deliverer. Lord, you are my rock of Israel. Lord, you are my shield. Lord, you are the horn of my salvation. Lord, you are my stronghold. May the Lord hear these proclamations. May he make us worthy of all of these divine names, which today are written in our heart, so that we, through the proclamation of the word of God, could see them in our life. Because without proclaiming the word of God, none of these characteristics will become amen in our life. All of the promises are yes and amen. The word yes and amen is a word, not a thought. Yes and amen. Let there be light. And there was light. Amen. We see that all of this must be proclaimed by our lips. And so we have already studied the name of the Lord, my strength. And also, Lord, you are my rock. And today we will conclude at remembering the name, Lord, you are my fortress. And we found out that after we, having magnified the word of God in our heart, are clothed in the powers of the name of God's strength, and after this, when we weigh ourselves on the scales of justice, having cleansed ourselves from all impurities of the flesh and spirit, only after this we will receive the right in order to use the name of God, you are my strength. The name of God, fortress, is used in this prayer battle as an inherited portion of the Son of God in whom and through whom a person can run to God to know God and be fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven containing the program of the sworn promises of God. In Hebrew, the name of God, fortress, fortress is defined by scripture as the abode of God, the dwelling of God, the sanctuary of God in which God dwells, the place where man knows God, the opportunity to be fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven, the atmosphere of God's success and God's joy and hope and trust in God. Practically, the fortress of God is a specific place where God dwells in the limits of which we can acknowledge God and be fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven. On this place where God dwells, a person can know God. And how do we know God? When we have the opportunity to be fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven. When we hear the word in which there is a promise, the sworn promise. And when, for example, in our case, when Pastor Akadi speaks, we are sitting and everyone is sitting quietly. And we inside, though, are saying, let it be to me according to your word. I accept this. Let it be to me according to your word. I think you all do this, and I do this as well. We, with great respect, are listening. We don't yell. We're not loud. And inside, we yell, Let it be to me, Lord, according to your word of this holy messenger. I accept this word. Let it be to me according to your word, we say within us. And we know that this place where we run to is found in three unique dimensions, in the height of the heavens, in the sanctuary that is known as the body of Christ, and in the face of God's chosen remnant, and also in the heart of a person who is humble and contrite, and who trembles before the preached word of God from the person whom God has clothed in the powers of his fatherhood and in the lips of the helpers of this person. Thus the verb, draw near to God as to our fortress, contains the abilities that give a person the ability to be fertilized by the seed of the promise that relates to the door of our hope with the fruit of which God will receive the basis to enter into battle over our body in order to destroy the power of death in our body, and with a sound to forever cast the old man out of our body, whose weapon is the power of death. This the Lord can do 
through the fruit which we will bear. And to bear fruit in the face of Methuselah is impossible. If we do not collaborate with the name of God, Lord, you are my fortress, meaning we run to him as our fortress. But what's interesting is that the word fortress, it's not just as, the, as, it's not just as a noun, but it's also a verb we run to. In Hebrew, the phrase to draw near or run to God means to approach the altar, to proceed to the knowledge of God, to enter the sanctuary of God, draw near to God, to resort to the help of God, finding yourself in the fortress of God, to be fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven, and to cultivate fruit to offer God. This is a verb when we run to Him. And this verb will practically collaborating with the name of God, you are my fortress, begins from His verb. We run to Him. Who do we run to? To the name of God, strength. When we magnify the Word of God, then we run to the name of God, rock. When we begin to weigh ourselves, judge ourselves, condemn ourselves, confess our sins, and then we begin to run to the name of God, fortress. When we come to the name of God, fortress, there is something unique that occurs. We are fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven that will allow us to give birth to our Methuselah, who is going to be able to banish death. God is going to banish death through that promise which we will receive when we run to God as to the Lord our fortress. Therefore, the Lord fortress discovers itself as a verb. When we come to each of His names, when we come to Him as to our fortress, then here we give birth to our promise, which is going to be capable of adopting our body and save our, our mortal souls. And so each time God, through the Holy Spirit, allows a person to run or draw near to Him, then as a result of this closeness, we will always have a coinciding fruit in the sphere in which we run to God. But also, like in the previous names of God, we should note that the presence of the fortress of God in one of the spheres of our life cannot be an automatic guarantee for its presence in other spheres. Because according to Scripture, for the presence of the fortress of God, each individual sphere of our life must be brought to a state in which the powers of God could exalt in this sphere and produce fruit of a fortress in the subject of our salvation. Thus, it is us who, in each individual sphere of our being, are responsible for creating a kind of atmosphere that could give God the basis to be our fortress. And we know that this atmosphere is the good soil of our heart that is capable of accepting in itself the seed of the Word of God and to produce fruit that coincides to the seed that was accepted. And for this purpose, just as we did in the previous names of God that are called to become the portion of our salvation, it was necessary for us to look at four classic questions. This is to define the name of God fortress, the purpose of it, what price is necessary to pay, and also by what results and by what fruit should we define that we have an inherited portion in the name of God fortress. And so the fourth question, which we are going to conclude today, again, how it sounds, by what results should we define that God is our fortress? in the realization of our calling that is comprised of the adoption of our body through the redemption of Christ so that we are made carriers of a heavenly body. And we looked at seven signs and today we will look at the eighth sign. And the eighth sign that our heart is a fortress for God and that we find ourselves in the fortress of God will be our ability to give God the basis to place us in Christ. If you remember, in the seventh sign, we had taken a look at how Christ can be found in us or can be placed in our heart. And in this eighth sign, we are looking at how, t how God gives us a base, the basis to place us in Christ. And as far as we allow Christ to be in us, in the same manner, Christ will allow us to be found in Him. And as we had said, we are like, uh, there's like an ocean and there's a ship and however much water you fill it with, however much water you fill this with, it then sinks into the ocean, coinciding to the amount of water that is, that is filled in it. This means that as, the, as far as we allow the Lord to dwell in us, or rather, as far as we allow the Lord to be in us, because we're so used to, we run to God saying, Lord, Lord, help me. He runs to us and He says, can you open the door for me? 
I, we have gotten used to knocking to the Lord. When you knock, you will answer. When you seek, you will find. To those who knock, it will be opened. And then the Lord all of a sudden says, I am the first one who knocks. And He knocks on the door of our heart. We open our heart and allow Him to enter. And as much as we allow Him to enter, He says, Can I sit with you and can I dine with you? Who? I, a son, and the Holy Spirit. And we allow them in. And then He says, Well, as you allow me to be here with my Son and the Holy Spirit, in the same way, I will then allow you to sit with me. Where, Lord? On my throne. As I sat on the throne of my Father, Christ says, We will sit on the throne of my Father. He says, If you are found in me and with me, then you will sit with me on the throne. Or on the throne of my Heavenly Father, because He is with the Father. It was interesting for us to look at what humility is necessary from the position of the throne can you imagine to sit on the throne on which the father sits the throne on which he sat his son and the throne upon which the bride of the lamb will sit to sit on this throne it turns out again we are talking right now we must have these results and signs and it is for this reason that we are called to live it's just unfortunate that this is not preached People usually offer this in a different way. They say, when he sits on the throne, we all sinners will stand before him and he'll send some to heaven, some to hell. No, of course, well, there will be these kind of people, but those people that are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years on the planet Earth, the the bride, she's not going to stand on the left or the right. She will sit with Christ. She will receive her reward. She already, through the word of God today, that which does not coincide, she throws out to the left, and that which does coincide, she affirms in the righteousness of God. Today we are enduring and facing what many will face before the white throne and we are conducting this white throne today so that then we don't end up there so that we can actually be found in the position of which we are sitting on the throne with the Father and this is the interesting fate of saints. And so the eighth sign, the Lord gives us the opportunity to place us in Christ. And we looked at five components. Let us today look at the other components. There are 12 of them total. We will turn to the sixth one. Our dwelling in Christ. So again, our dwelling in Christ, in whom God becomes our fortress, should be defined by the presence of dignities in us that testify that we have wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. When we have these four things, this means that we dwell in Christ Jesus. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter one, verse thirty. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Not just Christ, but you who are in Christ. Meaning, we ought to have these qualities: righteousness, wisdom sanctification, and redemption. These four things. Let us, uh, in summary, look at them. Wisdom that must not just be in Christ, but in us also, because in Him we are in Christ. We are in Christ. Because it says, but of Him you are in Christ Jesus. Wisdom is defined in Scripture as the fear of the Lord, which a person can be filled with, in Christ Jesus by fulfilling a number of conditions and these conditions are written about in Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 3 there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord his delight is in the fear of the Lord and he shall judge not by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears from this place of scripture, there are four components that will allow us to the right to have wisdom that is going to be expressed in the fear of the Lord. Lord, I want to have this wisdom, the Lord says. We'll take a look what Isaiah says. Isaiah shows you how you ought to have this wisdom. First, out of what we have read, we must be a person who will be a rod and a branch with an organized partaking to the root of Jesse. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So we must come and proceed from this root. Why? So that that, uh, that drink, that olive juice, can become our achievement, uh, can become our belonging, we should say. And this rod, this stem, was David. Jesse had many sons, 
but we see that none of them had been this stem and rod. If you are asked, if you're asked to, if you ask children, what separates David from his other sons in the house of Jesse? They will say David was a shepherd. What about the others? Others, others. Well, what is a shepherd? He tended. What did he tend to? The flock of his father. What is the flock of the father? The thoughts of his father. Our children answer these questions. This means that if I come from the stem of Jesse and I am the from these roots, this is defined by my relationship to that preached word which the Lord gives to me from my father through the person who represents the fatherhood of God on earth. Through our relationship to the word of the messenger of God is defined if we are this stem that has a relation to the root of Jesse. Why? So that we have a right to wisdom. And there are four components to- total. First one is not enough. Upon this person will dwell the spirit of counsel, the spirit of guidance and wisdom, as had dwelled on David. He is going to be clothed in the reigning teaching of Christ. This is wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel and might, knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Third, this person must be filled with the fear of the Lord, which is the wisdom of God that yields the reigning teaching of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh. This is the third component. He must have the fear of the Lord. And the presence of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh in my heart is defined by the presence of the fear of the Lord. If a person does not have the fear of the Lord, he does not have a teaching. But this person might say a lot. He can explain everything so beautifully. He can say many things beautifully. But the true presence of the teaching is defined by the format of the fear of the Lord. How much the fear of the Lord is present in a person, in such a manner the truth is present. And fourth, as a result of being filled with the fear of the Lord, a person will receive the ability to judge not by the look of his eyes and not by the hearing of his ears and decide the fears of the four and of the sufferers of the earth. If we say, have you heard this? Have you heard this about this person? What does this tell us? Why do we judge so easily others? I heard this. Someone with fear will not be based on what he hears or has the ability to judge by the look of his eyes. I am not, how can I say this about this person? Perhaps he's already repented. Perhaps he has already repented. So through this is defined how we, who we judge. And through this is defined if we have the fear of the Lord. If there is no fear of the Lord, this means we don't have teaching. If we don't have the teaching, this means that we are not tied to the root of Jesse. We don't acknowledge the uh, anointed man of the Lord, although we might say, I am standing as a wall behind Pastor Arkady. We ought not to, with our tongue, spread slander or gossip against one another. And this will be wisdom in us avoiding this. For the Lord has been made for us not just wisdom, but also our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Righteousness is our good works that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and are made in God, the final goal of which is the adoption of our body through the redemption of Christ. This is righteousness, good deeds. Evangelism doesn't always bring to the adoption of the body. Miracles and wonders don't always bring to the adoption of our body. So our calling, which is to adopt our bodies. If you ask a person, evangelist, something about this promise, he is going to look at you for a long time and say, I don't understand what you're saying. Wow, this is righteousness. Righteousness contained in your good works and you must preach to saints who come about the adoption of the body. What adoption of the body, they say. The fact that they receive salvation is a deposit. What deposit? They are saved, he says. Their spirit is saved and during an amount of time they must They must save their soul and save their body. We have very, very little time remaining. Very little time. Take a look. I'm all covered in wrinkles. There's very little time left. What does this tell us? Look at the mirror. Look at the mirror. This tells us what? We have a very short amount of time. And all that is necessary to do is so that that salvation that we receive as a deposit for it to become our belonging. And this is going to be righteousness. The third quality, we must have sanctification. Sanctification is the readiness to present our body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God for our reasonable service. Take a look at how closely it is tied. Lord, I want to present my body for service. He says, you first 
take by adoption of your body by faith the salvation of your body your whole essence take it by faith and then offer uh, offer yourself to the lord as he doesn't want anything to do with our body when we don't have the truth about the adoption of the body your body is a temple a temple of the holy spirit I don't understand what it means to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. This means that the Lord wants to adopt our body and to make us not just His home, but also His temple. Because we're not just a royal home, but we are a royal priesthood. The house in which the Lord lives and the house in which God is worshipped. And all of this is in our body. Therefore, Lord, when I in righteousness have understood that the goal and purpose of all of my good deeds are for the adoption of the body, and now through sanctification I present my body in which this information lives as a holy, pleasing sacrifice to God for reasonable service. And fourth, redemption. Redemption, as we have read. Of him you are in Christ, who has been made for us the wisdom of God. Wisdom, sanctification, righteousness, and redemption. Redemption is called to become our property only in Christ, because the price of our redemption before God is the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Let us take a look at how the 24 elders and the 24, uh, the four living creatures and the 24 elders related to redemption. For these people, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, redemption became their belonging. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. They thank Jesus for what he has done for them. And then what do they say after this? They say, you were pierced for us, slain for us, and you redeemed us. This we receive as a deposit, and our pastor says true redemption must become our belonging, our property. Take a look at what they say further along, what these four living creatures and 24 elders say. And you have made us, made us in Christ. Made us, meaning collaborated. We collaborated with you. Not just in the covenant of blood, but also in the covenant of salt. We collaborated with you. You made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth a thousand years. And then we will sit with Christ Jesus on the throne. It means that we don't just thank for the blood. We think we will thank it always. But if after this we don't say, you have made us... We have collaborated with you. We're in the covenant of salt. Pastor writes, At the same time, I want to remind you that everything that we can have in Christ Jesus, including our redemption, can be ours only one way, through the proclamation of the faith of our heart. This was an interesting sixth component for us. We ought to have wisdom from God, righteousness from God, sanctification from God and redemption from God and in God. These four qualities must become our property. The seventh component of our dwelling in Christ in whom God becomes our fortress should be defined by the presence of the fact that we have died to sin and live for God. Or, according to signs that we have been freed from the law of sin and death. Meaning we have died to sin and live for God. This is defined by the fact that we have been freed from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, the, the last sentence, again, we're talking about how to place ourselves in Christ, and for this is necessary to consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us take a look at how this is said by our apostle so we correctly understand. So sometimes people will say, I've done many sins, and then they say, well, I consider myself dead to sin, but alive to God. Is this going to be correct before God, this will be incorrect because this quality that you are talking about or this kind of a person 
means that this person is legalizing sin. But that quality that Apostle Paul is speaking to us and Apostle Adagaji explained to us, this we are hearing how to place ourselves in Christ to be rid of sin and not to legalize sin. Let's listen very attentively so that we no longer say this kind of foolishness. You sin, sin, and then you say, well, I consider myself dead to sin and alive to God. That's it. I am clean. I am. I consider myself dead to sin. That is not correct. Let's listen closely so that we never have this kind of question again, so that we do not um, mock the Word of God. The reason we are called to consider ourselves dead to sin but alive for God in Christ Jesus is that Christ, having risen from the death, dead no longer dies, death no longer has power over Him. For He died once for sin, and what lives then lives for God. However, this is only for those who are in Christ Jesus. If a person affirms when he says, I am dead to sin and alive to God, and is convinced that he is in Christ, but at the same time has no evidence that he died to sin and lives for God, he seduces himself. It turns out that this thing to proclaim, if a person does not live according to his proclamation, our pastor says that this kind of a person seduces himself. A person abiding in Christ Jesus will be freed from the dependence of reigning sin in his body because due to access to his righteousness in Christ Jesus, the old man will be bound and imprisoned. As written, assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The semantic meaning of this translation is that the earth expresses the will of heaven and not heaven expresses the will of the earth, and therefore the version of this translation should be so. Assuredly I say to you, that whatever you will bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and that which you loose on earth by then will be loosed in heaven. The phrase bound in heaven and loosed in heaven is referring to bound in Christ and loosed in Christ. That is why we proclaim being still in the slavery of sin, having reigning sin. We ought to proclaim, Lord, I consider myself dead to sin, but alive to God. Not to say that I am legalizing sin. God is not looking at this. No, God looks at this. This proclamation is to place me in Christ Jesus, only in Christ. Because in Christ, God has already bound this sin in Christ Jesus, He has already delivered us from this sin. That's why, through proclamation, we place ourselves in Christ Jesus. We cannot bind the old man in our body outside of Christ and independently of Christ. All the power that is given to us on earth is given to us in righteousness of Christ Jesus, in whom God raised us up and planted him alongside the right hand of the throne of the Heavenly Father. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We, dead in trespasses, made a, he made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. However, in order to give God the foundation to resurrect us in Christ and to place us with Him in heaven, it is first necessary in Christ and with Christ to die to our nation, to the house of our Father, and to the corrupt lusts of our soul. We need to understand that resurrection in Christ Jesus is possible only in one case. If we have endured death with him, in which we, with the law, died to the law, to live for the one who died for our sins and who rose for our justification. Romans 10, or rather 8, verses 1 through 2. If we do not have in ourselves, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Therefore, if we do not have in ourselves death to sin, we can in no way be placed in Christ Jesus, and therefore, we cannot have access to the limits of the fortress of God outside of Christ. But this proclamation that we do, I consider myself dead to sin and alive to God, 
it is given only to place us in Christ, and in order for us to have the legal right to resurrection, not just resurrection, but to being united with Him in the likeness of His death, so that having been united with Him in the likeness of His death, we can be united in the likeness of His resurrection. We have to understand that this proclamation is not to legalize sin, and with ease, we look at and say, you know, I sinned, I, for example, had resented you and and I had slandered against you and I come up to you and I say, you know, I've considered myself dead to sin and alive to God, therefore everything is fine. No one does this. No one ought to do this. This is not supposed to be done in this way. Scripture says that we're called to express this to God. Lord, I consider myself dead to sin and alive to God because God says with the tongue of eternity and not with the language of time. In time, we don't yet meet the standards of perfection, but God in Christ Jesus views us as perfect. Therefore, we ought to move to the uh, language of eternity. We can never have the qualities of Christ if we are going to speak with the language of time. The language of time is, I have sinned, forgive me, and the language of eternity as I thank you Lord in Christ Jesus I consider myself dead to sin and life to God I accept this grace let the grace reign in me through righteousness the essence of this to call the inexistent as existent is for the reason or the purpose of receiving the legal basis to this perfection to give God the right to move through this language of eternity. If we always speak with God with the language of time, then this is going to be, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, forgive me. Forgive me. This is the language of time. Pastor, forgive me, I shouldn't have said this. Forgive me, I violated this, or I've done this. This is the language of time, and this is fine. Forgive me, forgive me. This is... I'm 50 years old, I'm 80 years old, forgive me please, 90, 120 years old, forgive me. This is the language of time. And this, forgive me please, is always going to be present because of the language of time, but it is necessary for us to speak with the language of eternity. That which Christ had done, this is the language of eternity. I call this inexistent as existent, but I do not ignore the language of time. If I've offended my brother, I ask for forgiveness. And this is very important. The language of time is to repent before saints and before the one whom you have hurt. But to no longer sin, we need to use the language of eternity to call the inexistent as existent so that I have the legitimate legal right to be clothed in these virtues. This is the interesting seventh component, the eighth component of dwelling in Christ in which God becomes our fortress should be defined by the presence in our spirit that testify of signs that we are the carriers of resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 22 through 23. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ at his coming. God, by the power of His omnipresence that yields the fourth dimension, simultaneously dwells in the present, past, and future. Therefore, with the presence of our death in Christ, in which which we were immersed through baptism in water, Holy Spirit, and fire, God has resurrected us in the coming of Christ for His bride. Because the Lord looks not with the language of uh, eternity he also looks in the language of time because he dwells in the past present and future therefore when we are baptized the Lord already views us as resurrected sitting with him on the throne however if in the dimension of time dimension of time again is very important without we can't go anywhere and without the dimension of eternity we can't go anywhere we must understand write this highlight this for us dimension of time dimension of eternity and to not mix them up without our correct collaboration with these dimensions we won't go anywhere we won't achieve any victories again if in the dimension of time we do not become carriers of the death of christ in which we with christ die to sin that we inherited from the vain life of our fathers expressed in death to our nation our household and our carnal life we will not be capable of carrying the resurrection of Christ in our spirit, in which we receive the deposit of our justification. 
And therefore, on the other side of time, in the coming of the Son of God, we will not be able to inherit the, in, the resurrection of life. When we speak of the death of the Lord Jesus, this is the language of time. When we speak of resurrection, rapture, this is the language of eternity. Therefore, I, with the language of time, immersed in the death of the Lord Jesus, and God says, I want to speak with you the language of eternity. I see you resurrected in Christ. I see you, King, Priest. I see you sitting with me on the throne. I thank you, Lord. I accept this. I thank you that you have made me, made me, meaning I collaborated with you. You made us kings and priests, and we will reign in Christ Jesus with Christ Jesus. John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Who are those who have done evil? Those who have done evil are those who have refused to strive to enter through the narrow gates in order to place the deposit of their salvation into circulation and in this manner receive justification as their property all because they trusted in their own works, which they called good. And so Jesus had said, strive to enter through the narrow gates. Strive to enter through the narrow gates. Those who commit lawlessness, they don't want to enter through the narrow gates. Why? It is necessary to be tethered so that we enter through the narrow gates. To be tethered, it is a strong verb. This is uh, for those people that uh, want to talk with the, through the language of time and language of eternity. The kingdom of heaven is taken by energy with strength. There is strength that is called to be used. To be tied to is to use energy to show in our faith the virtue of God, to distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit from the voice of a seducer, to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to fight against reigning sin in our body to overcome in prayer battle against the attacks of evil and receive the help of the Holy Spirit. This is the word to be tied or tethered to. Basically, people who practice evil are people who had been given the kingdom of heaven in the format of a deposit, but because they refuse to be tethered so that they can enter the narrow gates which referred to the body of Christ in the face of God's chosen remnants, they were cast out of the kingdom of heaven which on earth was the bride of the Lamb in the face of God's chosen remnants. The kingdom of heaven abiding in three dimensions, the heights of the heavens, the sanctuary in the face of God's chosen remnants, and in a humble and contrite heart, has one street among which flows the river of life, and on both banks of the river grows the tree of life which bears twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees which were for the healing of the nations. People who have tethered themselves to enter into the kingdom of heaven through narrow gates were carriers of theocracy, which shields the order of the kingdom of heaven in the body of Christ. The calling of the carriers of the kingdom of heaven was the adoption of their, bo their bodies to the redemption of Christ or the erection of the power of life in their bodies. Whereas those who refused to enter through the narrow gates had many streets on which the wicked leaders watered them with the fierce wine of fornication since the structure of such assemblies was either a democratic system or a system of dictatorship, where pastors are selected by way of majority vote, or a dictatorship, where a person comes and says, the Holy Spirit sent me, he has given me another gospel. This all is very dangerous. These are the white gates, either a democratic structure or a dictatorship. This is a person who has sent himself. Both are dangerous. The assembly of these people and on the streets in which they ate and drank, they said, we ate and drank and were taught. You taught us. He says, I never taught you. You never ate and drank there. I taught only on my street in Jerusalem. There is one street. There is a theocratical structure. They say, strange. We said that this was you. There were lots of streets. There was different kinds of food. He says, no, I was not there. And all of this was in fact evil. All of that which they ate and drank was evil, because of which they were declared by God as workers of iniquity, since the calling of workers of iniquity is material success and evangelism, to which God did not call them. If we have used 
all of our energy and enter through the narrow gates and the usher in the face of the Holy Spirit as Lord and ruler of our life, open the doors of our heart for the reign of Christ in our body. And this means that our body is a fortress for God and we dwell in the fortress of God. This is the eighth component. The ninth component of Christ dwelling in us in which God becomes our fortress should be defined by signs that we carry that testify that we are established in the promises that carry salvation and are anointed by God. We must have a testimony, testify that we are affirmed in the promises and for this uh, we are anointed by God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20-21 through 21, For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Christ Jesus, and in Him, Amen. To the glory of God through us, says Apostle Paul, meaning through the Apostles. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. For God to establish us in the promises in which He promised to adopt our bodies through the redemption of Christ, it is necessary in the dimension of time to accept over us the authority of His Apostles in the face of a specific person who is clothed by the Holy Spirit with the powers of the Fatherhood of God. Because by establishing us in Christ Jesus, God will, along with men, through whose instruction we can inherit all the promises placed on our accounts in Christ Jesus. And again, because to affirm us in Christ Jesus, God will, along with men, this is very important. This very small letter with men. God will affirm us or establish us in Christ along with men. Through whose instruction we can inherit all of the promises placed on our accounts in Christ Jesus. God is going to with these people, not just through these people, but with these people he is going to grow us. He is going to prepare us with these people or with the person with whom or through whom we receive these revelations, this grace. We don't just receive through Him, but we together with Him will receive this glory that God has prepared for His church. And we must understand this, that God through them makes all the promises yes and amen in Christ Jesus, but also He does this with them and for them together and he uses them and he can take his messenger and for the church as Apostle Paul says I fulfill the weaknesses in my body so in order to not hit the church Apostle accepted the hits upon himself Apostle Paul did he had uh, died he was close to death many times and he's asked what why is this happening with you he says you want this to happen to you I'm afraid no one will remain in the church he says I accept these hits for you why does God take the person whom he clothes in the powers of the fatherhood of God who represents the interests on earth and why does he break him in order for there to be new positions opening in the church no when God breaks his messengers all the doors are closed and it is written on the door we no longer accept applications we don't accept any other positions God begins to do something and we must understand and when God uses the holy person the messenger of God scripture says for the glory of God through them that he is using our pastor he is used he used Apostle Paul Apostle Peter and other Apostles I was always astonished what a strange fate no one had died with just their own death they all were plagued or martyred all of them were ill ailing they were hit they were killed Lord why in order for them to share one reward with the church and that which that person through whom we have received this great promise that which is he enduring today that promise that lies at the door of our hope the reign the reign of the resurrection of Christ for this it is necessary for there to be a breaking Lord says this revelation is coming through this person it is necessary for this to come to power and to have a legitimate status for God it is necessary as Christ to break a person why did he break the Apostles 
to give the church together with the apostles, not through them, but with the apostles, this great reward. That's why the Lord breaks his saints who represent his interests in order for us together with them to be able to receive the power of resurrection. That's why Christ was broken. He was brought to contrition on Golgotha in order to resurrect. That's why we must understand that we must see the marking of God, that God will never allow access to resurrection if he doesn't see the presence of death. And death is revealed in contrition when God takes the vessel, brings it to contrition, and the church then receives the legal right to proclaim. There is a very high price behind this word. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Lord, all right. I, and he says, I will give this through contrition, and he breaks. And how we react, react toward this, how we understand this, how we see this great glory, this hand of God that stands behind all of this, that God is bringing us very closely to resurrection because he reveals himself very strongly in the death of the Lord Jesus for resurrection because he has very closely approached the resurrection of Christ in the body of his saints. To affirm us or establish us in the promises with the apostles, God will do through Hiram and his messengers who will build our house out of precious stones and cedar trees. Second Samuel chapter 5, verses 11-12 through 12. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David in cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And so here we have Hiram, here we have other personas, but let's start with the name Hiram. Hiram, the king of Tyr, means from favorable or noble descent. And this is an image of the Holy Spirit, whom we are called to accept as Lord and ruler of our life if our conscience is cleansed from dead works of religious virtues that come from the flesh. And then in our cleansed conscience that represents the good soil of our heart through the preached word of the apostles, the truth of the reigning teaching of Christ will be engraved. When we have this, the Holy Spirit is presented as Hiram, King of Tyr. If our heart is not a place in which the truth of the teaching of Christ is engraved in the twelve foundations of the walls of Jerusalem, then our heart will not be able to accept the Holy Spirit and distinguish Him from the seducing Spirit. To define in ourselves that we have truly accepted the Holy Spirit as Lord and ruler of our life, should be done by the presence of the messengers of the Holy Spirit, the presence of building material, and the presence of masons and carpenters. These three components ought to be, at, ought to be present, which will conduct this work. It is these three things that are called to build our body into a spiritual dwelling and a holy place. And let us, in summary, look at what they represent. The messengers of Hiram are apostles, or people who are clothed in the powers of the fatherhood of God. And the stones were the foundation of the home and cedar trees for the building of our body into a spiritual dwelling is an image of the revelations of the Holy Spirit in the lips of the messengers of Hiram and the carpenters and masons of Hiram that build our body into a spiritual dwelling and holy place is an image of our spiritual capabilities that we gained in the revelations of the Holy Spirit reveals the truth in our heart through instruction in faith. So the Mason is when we begin to renew our thinking with the spirit of our mind. We have the messenger, uh, Hiram, because our heart is cleansed from dead works. We have Hiram, we have sealed the truth, the teaching of the word, that he sends his messengers, gives us building material, and we, my uh, Masons and carpenters, begin to build together with the Holy Spirit and to build this building. And so, if we, if, it, if we are successful in discovering these personas in ourselves and our body is built into a spiritual dwelling and holy place, then this means that we are a fortress for God and God is our fortress. We must find in ourselves all these personas. This is an interesting ninth component. The tenth component of Christ dwelling in us, in which God becomes our fortress, should be defined by the presence of signs in us that testify that we are independent of religion, social class, and gender. It is only that person who is in Christ. Galatians 3, 26-28. 
For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In this place of scripture, being clothed in Christ occurs when we make a covenant of blood, salt, and rest with God in the baptism of water, Holy Spirit, and fire, as written, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We should note one irrefutable truth, that the initial making of a covenant of blood, salt, and rest with God in the baptism of water, Holy Spirit, and fire is the deposit that we must put into circulation so that the components of the covenant of blood, salt, and rest made in the baptism in water, Holy Spirit, and fire become our belonging. In other words, making a covenant of blood, salt, and rest with God in the baptism of water, Holy Spirit, and fire is not a one-time action, but a process in which we, through instruction in faith in obedience to the truth, are called to grow into the full measure of the stature of Christ. The Lord gives us baptism in water, Holy Spirit, and fire so that we can make a covenant of blood, salt, and rest. And we see that this is not a one-time this is this is one baptism, one covenant. But why did God offer it to us in this triplicity? So that what is carnal can become spiritual. Because it is necessary for a certain process to occur. The Lord did not offer water, Holy Spirit, and fire, covenant blood, salt, and rest as an alternative. And of course, if we say alternative, then someone will say, well, how should I be saved as a brand of fire? I want to live for myself and then repent before death. People, many people, went to church, sinned quietly so no one would see, and then repented right before death. Is this alter an alternative that I can choose? No. Pastor has said that baptism is one baptism. It is one faith, one covenant. They are not three alternatives. We select Oh, I don't want to pay a really high price. I just want to be saved. I will just be baptized in water. My name will be written in heaven and that's it. No, there are not three different alternatives. This is given only for us to be able to grow in the full measure of the stature of Christ. And this is done. So, And here we see that in Christ Jesus, when we are found in Christ, there is no male or gender. Let us remember what this is referring to because looking at this, it is necessary, not just in the church. In the church, there is no male, female. Uh, the Slavic people had to fight a long time f for them to stop saying, the sisters uh, must not preach in the church. Well, all right, then the sisters began to say poems in the church. They say, sisters have no right to open their mouth. She says, okay. They begin to prophesy. And she begins to control. Why did was a woman led to this in the church? Because these people are not Christ, and men don't act or behave correctly to the sisters, the woman. In Christ, there is no male or female. We must see in ourselves the quality of male and female, so that in the church we don't separate. We say, you are a woman in the church, therefore you must be quiet. Let us take a look at these qualities in us. Uh, the female function in the spirit of a person who is found in Christ is a supernatural ability and readiness to fertilize oneself with the seed of the preached word about the kingdom of heaven. This is the readiness, or in other words, when we are a good soil in order to receive the seed of the word of God. Whereas the male function in the spirit of a person who is found in Christ is a supernatural ability to proclaim the faith of the heart and thus be fertilized by the seed of the kingdom of heaven and grow the seed of the kingdom of heaven into the fruit of righteousness. If we have the ability to fertilize ourselves with the seed of the word of the, about the kingdom of God that we hear, then our body becomes a fortress for God and God in Christ becomes our fortress. So if we are fertilized by the seed of the word that we hear and when we proclaim the faith of our heart, this means that the Lord is our fortress. So in Christ Jesus, there is no male or female gender. This is only for those saints who know and understand the functions of the male and female, how they are expressed, and when we have both of these functions. There's also no slave nor free. 
This also is not relation to church to, to me, meaning when I renew my soul, my thinking with the spirit of my mind, there is then no difference. It becomes as one. My soul then has the mind of Christ. There is no more slave. There is no more free. This free has renewed my thinking, my slave. There is no male or female. Why? Because I saw in myself this male and female function. All of this is found in us. The eleventh component of Christ dwelling in us, in which God becomes our fortress, should be defined by the presence of signs in us that testify that we have faith that works through love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Faith that performs with something other than the love of God, agape, is a demonic faith. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 20. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Demonic faith is comprised of a person proclaiming with his lips the faith that is not in his heart, which proceeds, in fact, not from the love of God agape, from the law, but from the law of works that comes from the flesh. Thanks to this kind of faith, the law of works in the body of a person becomes the power of sin and death, which the old man trusts in, over which stand the organized powers of darkness. Demonic faith is faith in which there is no love of God agape, but which comes from the law of works. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, or the law of works. For the works of the flesh present in the law of works to lose their power. It is necessary to prepare our heart to hearing the promise that is comprised of the adoption of our body to the redemption of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 55. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? If we in the dimension of time take a look at how often pastor repeats dimension of time, dimension of eternity, dimension of time, dimension of eternity, what interesting limits we are presented with here. If we in the dimension of time do not refuse the law of works for the law for God has given us time for us to refuse this demonic faith, meaning I will do something to be saved. This is demonic faith. If we, in the dimension of time, praise God for this time, if we do not refuse the law of works and do not fertilize ourselves with the seed of the promise that relates to the adoption of our body through the redemption of Christ, we will not have the opportunity to have faith that works through love. And therefore, our body cannot be a fortress for God and God cannot have the basis to be our fortress. And so, in the dimension of time, the Lord delivers us and frees us from demonic faith. Demonic faith expresses itself in the law of works. Behind the law of works stands the law, the law of Moses. And behind the law of works is death itself. Therefore, time is very valuable in order for us in this time to demonstrate the love of God, agape, or the faith of God. Because we might do a lot of good works, but all of this are going to are going to be dead works. Scripture says you can give up all that you have and give up your body to be burned. But if we have not love, then Scripture says there will be no benefit from this, for this faith is demonic. And the twelfth component of our dwelling in Christ, in which God becomes our fortress, should be defined by the presence of signs in us that testify that we have the guarantee of rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Of course, not all those whom we buried as believers will be resurrected, and not all believers who survived at the coming of the Lord for His bride will change or transform in the blink of an eye, and we raptured in the clouds in a meeting with the Lord in the air. Because not all those who remain living during the time of resurrection were found in Christ, And therefore, not all who remain living will be transformed, and consequently not all will be raptured to meet with the Lord in the air. Luke 17, verses 26-37 And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said, Where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. According to this warning, it follows that the day in which the Son of Man will appear to take his bride from the earth will simultaneously coincide to the time of the days of Noah and Lot. So, what did they do in the days of Lot? They ate, drank, purchased, sold, planted, and built. In the days of Noah, they ate, drank, were married. Pay attention, between the days of Noah and the days of Lot, there is only one common fact. People ate and drank in both days. In the future, there is a cardinal difference. In the days of Noah, they married, while in the days of Lot, they bought, sold, planted, built. When there was, there, there was, uh, during that time of Lot, there was homosexualism, there was boyfriends, girlfriends, all of this evil of different homosexuals. They did not marry. But in the days of Lot, people purchased, bought, sold, planted, built. The fact is, is that in the described days of Noah and the days of Lot, the Holy Spirit, in fact, defined the state of His church or what will happen in the midst of His people who call themselves His church when Jesus returns in order to take His church out of the world. Returning to the days of Noah, it should be noted that it was the most amazing and surprising in its scientific and technological progress civilization exterminated by the waters of the global flood. Before the coming of Christ, civilization in its technical progress will quickly uh, hasten. And when it hastens and it hurries, this means that civilization is coming to its complete uh, destruction. And this is what will happen as it was in the days of Noah. Civilization came to its peak and it was exterminated by the waters of the global flood. And now let's study the phrase, ate and drink, which tells of the state of the nation of God in the days of Noah and the days of Lot and the day that will be when the Son of Man returns to those who are His. As in Hebrew, so in the original Greek language, the meaning of the phrase implies not only ordinary food and drink, but also food and drink of the human mind, which are human thoughts. As it is written in Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinks in his heart, or in his soul, so is he. They ate and drank. The thoughts of the human mind. The word ate means they ate, devoured, consumed, and clothed in extermination. Drink, meaning they absorbed, they got drunk, they were drunk, deprived themselves of sobriety. All of this is possible when people uh, rip out the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. This is what they are led to. 
or when they rip out the Word of God from the Holy Spirit and they begin to eat of it without the Holy Spirit, without His revelation. And the phrase, got married, defining the state of the days of Noah, means neglected the Spirit of God in favor of the daughters of men. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1-13 through 13 says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The daughters of men are the descendants of the daughters of Cain, representing the image of dead religion, either mired in occultism and religious rituals, or in all unnecessary and contrary to scripture prohibitions, or in false charismatic demonstrations with false miracles and signs. These are the daughters of men, the daughters of Cain. The combination of what is human and divine gave rise to giants in the form of gigantic religious entities that affect world politics and the economy. In Revelation, these gigantic religious movements are represented as a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Revelation chapter 17, verses 3 through 6, And the woman was taken, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, whereas God is show, then in another place shows Jerusalem, the great mighty Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, there is a harlot in the, uh, on the TV, on the different kinds of televisions. This harlot appears. Why? Because... She is trying to completely coincide to the heavenly Jerusalem, but can't. The golden cup in the hands of the woman is an image of scripture, and the contents of the cup were interpretations that distort the inner essence of the teaching of Christ. So they were clothed in all of these precious stones and the pearls incorrectly. Why? Because for them the golden cup is in their hand and there she misses, she mixes all of the abominations and filthiness. She interprets as she wishes. She doesn't want to accept the word in an intact format. And now let's turn to the days of Lot and the days of which they ate, drank, but also brought, sold, planted, built, which will correspond to the general state among the people of God when the Son of Man appears to rapture those who wait for him instead of building his building on an unshakable foundation of jerusalem consisting of 12 precious foundations he built his building on the sand where there was no need to pay a price for the foundation of this house if you look around and listen to what is taught in theological institutions and in most Christian churches and look at the structure of their government, then you will understand that this is a state of the days of Noah and the days of Lot, and that the rapture of the Lord is close now more than ever. If we, in the dimension of time, do not enter through the narrow gates which are the streets of Jerusalem where we can buy oil for the vessel of our hearts so that our lamp does not go out in the dark, we will not have opportunities to have a guarantee of our rapture and consequently our body cannot be a fortress for God and God cannot have the basis to become our fortress. Amen. Let us pray and thank God for that word that we had the opportunity to remember today. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the great privilege to be found in this place where your hand, which your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. We thank you that upon this place dwells a remembrance of your name, because you, Lord, upon this place have allowed us to hear your truth, your teaching. You have allowed us to place this teaching, this truth in our heart. And you have said we do this that we can stand before you as a continual remembrance. And we define that upon this place dwells a remembrance of your name. When on this place we hear your words, when we see the ladder that is standing here on the earth and that is touching heaven, when we see the angels of God that rise and descend, we hear those truths, those proclamations that we proclaim today. We thank you, Lord, 
or your divine language, the language of time and the language of eternity. We do not neglect one or the other, and we, with the language of time, and with the language of time, Lord, if we have not, if we have not yet cast away our vain life of our forefathers, we cast away, we proclaim that we have set aside the vain life of our forefathers, died to the vain life of our forefathers, through which curse enters our life. Speaking with the language of time, we today repent before you. Speaking with the language of time, we come to you today with our heart, with our distorted, with our wounded honor. We come with the sin that has grasped onto us. We come to you with our illnesses, our weaknesses, that you can heal us, so that you, Lord, can restore us, so that you can save us. We come to you, Lord, and we speak with you through the language of time, and we thank you for the language of eternity, that in Christ Jesus, you have raised us, you have sat us in heaven with Christ Jesus, and we are going to reign with you. We thank you, Lord, for that truth that you have given us, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to hear and understand the voice of the person who represents for us the fatherhood of God on the earth. We know his voice and we have not forgotten it. And we ask you, Lord, for your mercy to hurry for goodness for our soon meetings that we can again hear his voice so that it can pass along to us that good news that you have placed on his heart. And there is a lot, there is a lot which you want to make the belonging of our heart the belonging of our proclamation and we lord with patience wait we acknowledge that the language of time and the language of eternity is found in your hands we worship and bow down before you and are found in trembling before the time of god and we simply pray and ask you lord for your mercy to hurry for goodness for us so that our pastor can give to us that spiritual gift which he has for the affirmation of our souls. We thank you for this fellowship, this truth that we hear. We, Lord, are preparing our heart to accept those revelations that you have prepared for us in the future services. We thank you for the atmosphere of brotherly love that dwells in this place, and we thank you that upon this place does not dwell demonic faith. Upon this place dwells the faith of God, because we love one another with the love of God, agape, and this atmosphere is present here, and it is expressed in your divine order. We love your divine order. We magnify your word. We forgive one another, and we are ready to stoop down to one another's level. We refuse to bring, uh, to spread any kind of gossip. We refuse to judge anyone in those spheres for which we do not carry responsibility because we have the fear of the Lord. We have the fear of the Lord because you have placed this fear of God in the face of your Holy Spirit and the Word of God in our heart. And you have placed it there because we have made a decision to cleanse our conscience from dead works and to place through the acceptance of your messengers into our life, accept that material that they have given to us. And we, Lord, strive Tie, are tied to take these precious stones to take this tree cedar and to begin to build ourselves into a spiritual dwelling in a holy place to bring you sacrifices that are going to be pleasing to you we thank you lord for the beauty of your word and for the holy spirit who uncovers for us the significance of this word we thank you for your church your zion we thank you for those through whom you have passed along and through whom you plant in us this word we pray, Lord, that you also give mercy to the waters, that they can dwell in full humility, full meekness, in the contrition of their spirit. We thank you for those saints whom you are bringing through contrition today to give resurrection to your church. We see now more than ever through that which you are doing in the church that time has come near through that which you are doing in this world. How we see how the world cries out to you. How it is filled with fear. And this 
brings us joy. You have said, raise your heads. And we raise our heads and we thank you that you have delivered us and our deliverance is coming, that the adoption of our decaying bodies is, is soon, that our meeting with the Lord Jesus is approaching. And we foretaste this meeting with you. We foretaste this meeting with the holy face of our Heavenly Father. We foretaste this great privilege in Christ Jesus to sit with the Father in the arms of the Father in the den of Abraham. We thank you for this mercy and this wisdom and for this fate that you have uncovered for us in your word through your messengers. We accept this word in our hearts. We renew our thinking with this word and we proclaim it with our lips. Our Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will conclude with our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory and unblemished joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.